Good morning, everyone. That was half-hearted. Good morning, International. All right. Hawaiian is a beautiful language. Uh, however, the Italians would say, Dovremmo veramente imparare come parlare italiano perché un giorno in cielo tutti quanti parleremo italiano e così dobbiamo impararlo, no? Which being interpreted means we all need to learn Italian because when we're all in heaven, that's going to be the language of heaven. <laughs> I tried to convince them otherwise, it didn't go well. But uh, Hawaiian truly is a beautiful, all the, the vowels uh, and the sounds, very beautiful language. I don't know very many words in Italian, but I did learn one this week, that the valley here named Nu'uanu. Uh, what does Nu'uanu mean? Well, I looked it up and it means much rain. <laughs> no, that's not true. It doesn't mean that, but it seems like it. Very interesting the way the rain and the clouds work. We are so glad to be here with you. Last uh, Sunday, we cracked open the minor prophet of Malachi, part of the Part of the Bible, most of us don't spend a lot of time in those minor prophets, even the major prophets for that matter. Uh, they seem like downer books, and yet so many good principles uh, for us. And I, I'm just reminded, you know, the, the very reason we come to church, and I'm a person that grew up from cradle roll on going to church every week unless there was a really good reason that our family wouldn't go to church. I, I'm, I'm a church-going guy. And it's very easy, if that's been your experience, to make church become kind of a habit or a ritual or a duty, and, 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 and we lose what we really come together for. I mean, we just sang several choruses that referenced the greatness of God, praise to our God. Yeah, I've sung that one before, and, and we can stand and, and let the words come out, but somehow not make the heart connection. And I remind you that church is a place where we have the chance to see some heart work, heart change go on, whether it be, you know, eating uh, uh, what they, the good stuff that they provide in a cup of coffee and, and talking to someone, we might get our encouragement there, or whether it comes from singing a chorus about the greatness of God, or whether it comes from opening the Word together and seeing the truth. God's looking for heart change not ritualistic performance, and yet that's kind of where Israel was as we step into the book of Malachi. We talked about their history last week, all that they had been through. And now post-exilic, they've come back. The Persians allowed them to return to their homeland, and they were just kind of in the spiritual blahs. And I sure wouldn't want to ask anyone to share anything personal, raise hands, but it's been my experience that almost every believer I know at some point in their life has experienced the spiritual blahs. That's where we are right here. So we're in a series called Sharp Words for Dull Hearts because God addresses Israel through either the man Malachi or the man who took the title, my messenger, which is what Malachi means, and there is a back and forth and uh, it says there in your notes that Malachi starts with a big disconnect. Do you remember God starts out, I have loved you. And the unbelievable response is, yeah, I'm not seeing it. How have you loved us? I'm, I'm not feeling the love here. If you can imagine saying that to Almighty God who has just declared again that he loved him. But that's where it started out. I don't see God at work. I don't see his love for me. I'm not sure he's even trustworthy. Whatever. That's how you define the spiritual blahs. I don't see God at work in my life. He just seems to be quiet or silent or distant or maybe not even there. I don't know. And Israel was in a spiritually apathetic, disheartened state. They didn't respect God anymore. Now, this week, uh, when I thought of disrespect, which is what this next uh, back and forth is all about, I, I thought of the uh, king of disrespect. And if you're young, this may not be a familiar name, but if, if you've got any years, you know who this, this guy is. If we bring up his picture there uh, on, the, on the screen, on the wall. 
He's coming. He's not coming? Okay. Well, it's such a great picture. I was really hoping. Okay. Rodney Dangerfield. How many of you don't know who that is? Oh, most of you, I would assume, do know who that is. He, he was an, a guy, he lived in L.A., died in L.A. in 2004, but his famous line was always, I don't get no respect. And he, in kind of an East Coast cave, I don't get no respect. And then all the jokes he'd play off of that. My mom took me to a dog show, and I won. And he'd make these great, he'd make these great big eyes. I'm getting so old, my insurance company sends me half a calendar. I don't get no respect. I had plenty of pimples as a kid. One day I fell asleep in the library. When I woke up, a blind man was reading my face. You know, that, it was that kind of stuff. Corny, you know, old, old school humor. I don't get no respect. And in essence, that's what God says to Israel. You look in verse 6 of chapter 1 of Malachi, and God says, a son honors his father. The Jewish people knew all about this, right there in the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother, so it goes well with you. Life be long. And a servant honors his master. So there's two things they understood perfectly in the culture, the parental relationship and the servant-master relationship. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where's my honor? Wow, wow. And if I'm the master, where's my reverence? My goodness. I want to say some stuff about disrespect. And it certainly has influenced our culture on so many different levels. But these are simple fill-ins. If you got the notes in the back, if you didn't, eh, it's, I think it's even digitally available to you. First of all, disrespect in a relationship is destructive. We'll touch on this on Friday. And by the way, I hope you're able to be here, whether you're married or not. And by the way, I, I, I have to throw in a disclaimer. That was really over the top, an abundance of uh, uh, totally wisdom regarding marriage. Hey, this is an ongoing learning curve as a human being. I don't know if anyone has the corner on understanding all there is to say about marriage. And we're just meeting one evening. I think it's two 45-minute sessions. You can't even hardly crack the egg in that amount of time. But we'll, we'll look at some practical aspects that affect you, whether you're single or married. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But the way God has wired men in particular, uh, we have an innate desire to be respected. Uh, it, that's what Paul even hits, and we'll touch on it again in Ephesians 5. We'll touch on it Friday. Uh, very last verse of chapter 5. Therefore, a man ought to love his wife, and a wife ought to respect her husband. That's what, that's what men want, and when we're disrespected, that's a problem in marriage. And when women don't feel loved, that's a problem in marriage. But here, God, as Father, is saying, where's my honor in essence, where's my respect? It destroys a relationship where there's no respect. And boy, the, the examples, you may, they may be coming to your mind right now in your own life of when you have inadvertently disrespected someone else just by your tone of voice, let alone the words that you choose. Disrespect is destructive. Secondly, disrespect in a relationship is volatile. I was uh, Googling around this week looking at all kinds of historic insults, and particularly politicians and world leaders are famous for this. They say things about other world leaders that are like, are you kidding? Sometimes it has led to war, but you disrespect someone. And even in our gang culture, in the United, if you say the wrong thing to the wrong gang member, you disrespected me? And there's trouble. Creates heat. Disrespect in a relationship is volatile. And we're going to see what God says because he's being disrespected by the, the priests of Israel. And, and, and the third one there is disrespect in a relationship is insulting. I mean, these are obvious, but it's insulting. You know, 
if you're here for the first time and, and you're, you're here with your spouse and, and you came up afterwards and I had the chance to meet you, and, hey, welcome to International. This is a great group of people and I'm glad. Wow, your wife is ugly. Whoa, she fell out of the ugly tree, must have had every branch on the way down. <laughs> but anyway, I hope you come back. It's really great here at International. Okay, obviously, that's like, yeah, right, right. But insults are destructive. It's, they're disrespectful. That's the same guys as last week. And really what Israel does, as we're about to read in this chapter, is insult God, disrespect God, dishonor God, and they're not even aware of it. Here's what the text says. We already read it, verse 6. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If then I'm the father, where's my honor? And if I'm the master, where's my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. Yeah, you say, what? What, what, how, what? Come on, how have we despised your name? Wow. If anyone is due our respect and our reverence and our honor, it's, it's the living God. All he has done for us through grace, he doesn't deserve our disrespect. Well, how am I disrespecting him when my relationship on a daily basis with him becomes <sighs> just, just not that interesting? When I feel no draw to spend time with him, no desire to get into the Word, because we can go through the motions, and believe me, as a kid who grew up in church and has been in church his whole life, I know how to go through the motions with the best of them. Oh, man, get your, get your chart out. I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. Check a box. You know, Next day, read the next thing. Zzz, check the box. Next day, read the next. Zzz, zzz. Hey, what did you read? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't remember, but I checked the box. That's, that's going through the motions. And it's so easy to do in church culture. Just show up. We were talking this morning about, uh, or last night, excuse me, about growing up in church. And some and I have similar experiences. I was in church every Sunday morning. We had evening services back then. So you went home, ate dinner, and then came back for the Sunday evening service. We had Wednesday night programs for kids. We had other weekend events going on all the time. I was at every event all the time. And I even went to Christian school. Man, did I ever learn to go through the motions. And again, God is not interested in going through the motions. He wants our hearts. He wants us to want to love him. Where's the love? What do you mean, where's the love? I don't know. Where's the honor? What do, you, what do you mean? Where's the When you're going through the motions, you don't even realize that spiritually you're flatlining. And the relationship is <sighs> boring rather than exciting. In what way have we despised your name? Well, here we go. Verse 7. Well, here's one example, says God. You offer defiled food on my altar. And again, we have to think a little bit Hebrew here. The whole system of worship was considerably different than it is today. It still was acknowledging God, but it was through the Mosaic law and the sacrifices that were required and the offerings that were to be brought with a full heart, a willing heart. You offer defiled food. You, you, you give me junk, second best, damaged goods. And then you say, in what way have we defiled you? Well, here's another way. You actually say, well, the table of the Lord and all this stuff is contemptible. Man, we have to bring sacrifices. We have to do this. We have to do that. And, and I just think as a, as a pastor over the years of how many times I've heard, all the church wants is our money. All they talk about is money. They just want more money. I, you know, no pastor likes to talk about money for that very reason. But what does God want? God loves a cheerful giver. That comes from a heart attitude, not a, oh, yeah, I guess we got to, or, or, well, if I give, then God will, you know, it's a trade-off. He's looking for our hearts. But you, you say that having to give, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And then he gets real specific here. And when you offer the blind 
as a sacrifice, in other words, an animal that's damaged, is that not evil? Is that not wrong? Come on. And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? You're giving me second best or less than second best. And then he says, so offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? I don't think so. Expects a negative answer. Wow. I spent four wonderful years in the country of Italy doing church planning and evangelism. A number of churches supported us financially so that we could be there and do evangelism and church planting. Every church has a little bit different way of handling missions and missionaries. We were supported by a little rural church out in the middle of Oregon full of um, wheat farmers. And they were great people, but uh, there was not a lot of wealth and resource out in central Oregon. But they sent us a missionary care package. And we thought, how? Not, it was heavy. Well, we broke it open, and there in, in the bottom of the box, I thought it was cool but unusual, one of those ranchers who had all kinds of you know, tractors and uh, threshers and heavy equipment sent me his socket set. And, of course, it was standard. It wasn't even metric. I was living in Europe. They don't even know. So here I've got this super heavy, big, shiny socket set. Cool! Can't use it. But apparently he got a new one and didn't need that one anymore. And as we worked through the box, er everything had been used. And when we got to the children, they sent a toy. I remember my, my son was just four years old or so. They sent a, a little plastic car that only had three of the four wheels and had been used well for many years, and it looked like left outside and faded on one side. And, and that was their offering to the missionaries. Now, if I tell you this church, I'll feel guilty for the rest of my life, so I won't. But just the idea of let's give to the Lord's work the leftovers, or let's give to God's work. Oh, does that work? No. Maybe the missionaries can use it. Let's give to God's work less than our best. God asked for our best. He gave us his best. He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. Did we deserve that? No. He gave us his best. And when he asks us to be generous and open-handed, he's not looking to be disrespected by fulfilling a duty rather than giving from the heart. And, I'll, you know, I don't want to get the church in trouble financially, but if your heart is not in your giving, why give? God knows your heart. He's looking for a willing, cheerful heart, a respectful heart based on understanding how great is our God. When you offer the blind, would you give that to your governor? Probably not. I spent... Uh, three weeks doing some pastoral training in several countries on the east coast of India. We had pastors come from, had about 150 come from, they walked, they rode bikes, they, rode, they came from all over. Some of them traveled for two, three days for just a couple days of teaching and training. It was amazing. These guys would give all to serve Jesus. When the conference was over, our host said there's a family that wants to have you in their home for dinner. And understand these people are of extremely humble means. And we said we'd be honored. We went to their house. The, the, it, there were stone walls. It was about a two, maybe, I didn't see the whole house, but it was very small, four children, dirt floor. And we were the honored guests. My brother-in-law and I, we were the two that were on the, and then our host, three of us. We sat at the family table the father and our host hosted us in, in India, and my brother and all and I sat around the table. The children had to make a makeshift table in the other room. There wasn't room to sit together, and they brought out a chicken, which was, woo, they, they, don't, eat, they don't eat meat very often. They don't have it. They just eat, eat rice. And they brought out this chicken and insisted that my brother and I serve ourselves first. And you, the guilt, I just want to say, no, 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 no. And, and our host told us, and they, our, 
the people of the house didn't speak English, so he could tell us, he said, you will offend them if you do not eat uh, their chicken. I, and, and I'm looking at my paunch, and then I'm looking at those kids that needed it way more than I did. And I, I've never had a more guilty meal in my life. They gave their very best to strangers who really represented the Lord Jesus to them. I thought, oh, oh, how many times have I shortcut it when it comes to supporting the work of the Lord or, or not doing my best, doing second best and calling it good enough? We were able to after we left, leave, leave some resources for that family. They would not have received it at the time. It would have been an insult. But my goodness, they understood giving the best. God says, you're, you're not doing that. He's, so what does he say? Verse 10, I have no pleasure in you. Wow, this is his people. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Whoa. In other words, well, I, I brought my offering here. I Forget it. I don't even want it, says God. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. And you also say, oh, what? Where is it? This is just too much. I can't, I can't afford it. Either. And you sneer at it. The word is like sniff, snobbery. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Wow, this is what spiritual apathy looks like. You just don't care. You, you just aren't moved. You, you just, you're just going through the motions. In case anyone's watching. Wow. Oh. Disrespect in a relationship, in the notes there, also can bring reprisal. And the things that God, uh, God says to them there, in, uh, in chapter 2. And now, O priests, this commandment for you, and if you'll not hear, and if you'll not take it to heart and give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I'm going to send a curse upon you. I'm going to curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. I'm not getting through. I want your heart, not your emotions, not your ritual. That should follow your heart. I want your heart. You're not taking it to heart. And the next verses, I don't, I don't think I put them on the screen, but wow, th this, is, this is some kind of language from God to the priests who were supposed to be leading. He says, behold, I will rebuke your descendants. And the next line says, and spread refuse on your faces. There's a picture. Can we just upgrade the word refuse? Poop. I'm going to spread poop on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, the, the, and the one will take away with it. Then you're going to know that I've sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi, the priest, may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of one life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. Wow. So priests, take it to heart. Take it to heart. Take it to heart, or I will humiliate you. Wow. That sounds like a direct threat from God towards spiritual leaders that were happy with second best and not really into it. Now, okay, that's the priest. So I can sit here this morning and read Malachi and go, whew, that's not for me. Well, just hold a hold, 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 hold. Understand the difference between the Old and New Testaments and the way we approach God. It's quite a bit different. In the Old Testament, there was the tribe of Levi. The Levitical tribe was the priestly tribe. They represented God to the rest of the people. But in the New Testament, we are called a priesthood of believers. We don't go to a priest. We go directly to God. It's an amazing. We're so privileged to live in this uh, period of time. We go directly to God. But if you want to apply the principle of the Old Testament, Yikes. How we approach God, how much of our heart he has, that's a big deal. Mm. 
Disrespect brings reprisal. This is what's going to happen to you if, if, if you're not going to get it. You're not going to get through. Down on verse 7, chapter 2, For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. That's what should happen, for he's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And here's the three finger pointers at the end of the passage that we'll look at today. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And that's where we can come centuries away from the Levitical priesthood, the book of Malachi, the apathy of that period of time, 400 years before Jesus was born, and ask those questions of ourselves because as one who grew up in church, I know how easy it is to slip into doing the motions, to, to not really serving God from the heart but doing it because I'm a good person and it's the right thing to do and I want other people to see that, yes, I'm a person of faith that goes to church on Sunday and I love Jesus and I... God wants our heart more than anything else. From that, everything else follows. So it says there in your notes, based on verse 8 that we just read, spiritual apathy causes one, first of all, to leave the rails. We're living in a day and age when... For now, more than one generation, our young people who grow up going to church, who grow up with a spiritual foundation, are leaving the church in droves. As soon as they leave home and make their own decisions about how they'll spend their time, who they'll spend their time with, they're leaving church as irrelevant, and it doesn't, I don't need it, and it's not, and I... Spiritual apathy causes a person to leave the rails. If it's not real... Spiritual apathy negatively affects other people. It negatively affects other, pe other people. Watch. You know the most common, as a pastor, there's several questions I ask of people I don't know on the street or wherever that you meet. Are you a person of faith? Uh, um, do, do, you, uh, do you have a church where you worship? Well, no. Um, yeah, I, I went to a church, but, and then they hesitate as to whether they should tell me how they got burned at church or how they saw all the hypocrites in church or how the, the pastor did this or did, 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 did all the, re the way we live, the way we interact, if we are living an apathetic, going through the motions kind of spirituality will negatively affect other people. People, people smell genuineness. And they also smell non-genuineness, especially the younger generation. They're all about authentic. And when they don't smell authentic in church, <laughs> spiritual apathy negatively affects others. Spiritual apathy demeans what God has done for us. Last Sunday, we shared those elements, and every time we do that, it's designed for us to pause and just not remember, oh, yeah, bread and then cup. And then, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. We're, we're being reminded of what our God did for every one of us. He laid his life down. He suffered brutally, brutal death, humiliating, the worst form of death in the known world at that time, crucifixion, to pay the price for my sin and for your sin. And if we can take communion and not even feel that or not, not even acknowledge, whoa, then something has gone flat. Somehow some of that apathy virus has crept in. We don't want to demean what God has done for us. We want to extol and every day realize no matter how bad today is, no matter how bad this week is, and some weeks, this is life, you know, it's got potholes. No matter what, I'm going to heaven one day. 
And I won't have any of the issues I have now. I won't, have any, I won't be as ugly as I am now. I won't be everything. It's going to be fantastic. Paul says, you know, I don't know what's better for me to stay and help you people or to go to be with Christ. Well, I know what's better. That's way better, far better. Okay, in his time, that'll happen. In the meantime, i got work to do. I love the intentionality and the passion with which that man lived his life. He got the snorts beat out of him all the way along the way as he shared Jesus. He got stoned. He got caned. He, uh, he got let out on the open sea, floating, you know, paddling along with a board. He, he had a rough go. For me to live is Christ. To die, gain. Where is that in our churches today, in our lives today? So three questions as we wind it down here. Please take these personally. Don't think of your spouse or your friend or whoever. Think of yourself. Do I really desire to please God? Do I really do? We sing that we do. We say that we do. Do I really desire to please God? Do I really desire to serve God? Later on in the summer, we're going to talk about spiritual gifts and how God has wired us and, and the process of discovering what, how can I best serve God? Because we're all different. He's wired us all a little bit differently. How can I, do I really desire to serve God? I've always seen church as a two-way street. We come and we receive from relationships, from the Word, and from it, but we're also here to serve. Do I really want to serve God? Number three, do I understand God's authority? And there's that word that today is not a particularly popular word. Everything God commands us, all the parameters he gives us in Scripture are for our own good. Living as a Christian is not a smothered life of rules and regulations. He frees us up to please him and ultimately, ultimately enjoy life to the max. And finally, as a follower of Christ, am I satisfied with good enough? Good enough. So here's what I'd like you to do individually, and this is not in your notes, but I'm going to show you a couple of continuums. This is a mental exercise, kind of between you and the Lord. Here's, here's the first continuum. Today, sitting here at International Baptist Church, here's where I am. Far left, and I hope none of us would mark it way over there on this side. My spiritual life, and maybe some days more than others, is simply going through the motions. In fact, I don't even know why I'm here today. I, I hope that's not you. Well, the extreme, others say, I am all in. Me and Paul. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm all in. And, you know, most of us would not say that if we were 100% honest. So, but in your mind, I don't want to know, this is not a show of hands or anything like that. In your mind, you mark where you are. Honestly. See, the priests in Malachi 1 and 2 here, we're fine, we're doing good. What, what, what? How do we disrespect you? Whoa, they needed a, they needed a gut check. And God gave them one. Let me tell you what the problem is. Now, if God were here today, I wonder where he'd put you on that line. Here's where I am. Here's the comparative, the next, the next continuum. Here's where I want to be. Well, now we're all going to say, that I, I want to be over here. But life dishes out this and challenges me with that. And then there's this temptation and there's that challenge and this problem. And I, I uh, yeah, yeah, and it's just easy to gently move toward a little bit of apathy. It's, why try so hard? God made me this. He knows me. I'm not, I'm not going to I'm not going to go crazy over. I'm just going to really where would you like to be in your relationship with God? Now, I'm not talking about your salvation with God. That I think scripture tells us is kind of yes or no. Either your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because you trusted by faith in Christ who paid for your sins, or you haven't settled that issue and your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. That's not a continuum. That's a yes or a no. 
but talking about living our life every day, oh, that, that's a continuum. That changes from day to day. I can have a day where I just, it just, it's just not happening for me. Where are you today? Pray with me. Father, we read your words through Malachi to those priests, and that's pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. It's very clear God told them, you're giving me second best, and you're not even aware of it. You even threaten them. If you don't take this to heart, and he gives that awful illustration, I'm going to rub refuse in your faces, you bunch of hypocrites. Wow. Father, it makes me wonder today where each one of us are spiritually, and that's between each one of us and you. But this morning through your Holy Spirit, maybe, maybe it's a time when you just prod us, you poke us, you move us a little bit off of going through the motions in the direction of more of a heartfelt relationship day to day with Jesus. Father, I pray you'd move us in that direction through the power of your word and the words of Malachi that are centuries old. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.